awkward. So a few ground rules for the meeting. Um, everyone, if you would please keep your microphone muted and your video turned off uh, if you can, uh, unless we unless you want to speak later on in the meeting that should help with the quality of the, of the presentation for everybody. Uh, so there will be time uh, during the meeting for feedback. Uh, two ways to do that uh, towards the end. We're going to have a time where we'll actually open it up for people to ask questions and have a dialogue for comfortable in this format. And you can use the raise hand feature uh, to do that and uh, we'll uh, invite you to, to share your comments at that time. At any time during the meeting, though, if there's something that you have a question about, feel free to chat, type it into the, the chat box. Uh, hopefully you all know how to do that. Um, Rob, if you can demonstrate where that is or Carrie, who's running the meeting here, where those buttons are to go ahead and click to get a chat box up. That would be great. There it is. So you can see everything looks a little double right now, but there is a place where you can go up there and uh, type a chat and then right beside it is the icon to raise your hand if you need to raise your hand uh, later when we have open discussion. There will be also a comment form that's going to be uh, posted and available on the website and we'll show you that later. So don't feel like you have to give us all your feedback this evening. This is really an introduction to where we are and what's going on. Uh, we'd love to have questions and dialogue today, but the opportunity for comment will continue for a while. So the outline for tonight's meeting, um, I'm going to give a little bit of introductions, uh, not as long as normal. Um, and then uh, we're going to go back and, and kind of revisit the Pine Grove Mill small area plan and as kind of the origin of what we're doing with this mobility study. And then <clears throat> talk through a little bit about what the study process is for what we're doing for this, looking at the mobility aspects of the Pine Grove Mills area and then visit in a uh, little more detail some of those specific recommendations that came out of the small area plan. Really that small area plan was the foundation for moving forward with what we're doing with this mobility study. We'll have some time for some some feedback and some question answers and then we'll we'll visit where we're going next next steps on the project. So uh, real quick introductions. So for myself, for those of you that don't know me, I am Ron Seibert. I am the engineer here at Ferguson Township and I'm the um, project manager for the township on the township side of the project. Um, Jim May is the director of Center Region Planning Agency and he was heavily involved in facilitating the Pine Grove Mills small area plan project. Um, still hoping he shows up here. Uh, Jim was going to give or intends to give a kind of a summary of that process for the small area plan again is how it laid the foundation for this mobility study. Uh, if Jim doesn't make it, we have his slides. We'll, we'll touch on some of his bullet points, but obviously we won't be able to give a lot of the rich color and texture uh, that Jim would have been able to do. And then the bulk of the presentation is going to be given by Rob Watts. Uh, Rob is a transportation engineer with McCormick Taylor, who's the consultant that was um, hired by the township to prepare this mobility study. Um, they provide various transportation planning services to the township and even completed a similar study to this for the Northland area of the township. That's the area up around Martin Street, Blue Course Drive and North Atherton Street. Uh, so this study kind of follows a similar format, uh, but the scope of course has been adjusted um, to be more specific to this study area, to this planning area, and consider also the work that had been done as part of the small area plan with the Northland area mobility. We were really starting without all the effort in the background um, that we, that this that this project has. So Rob's going to walk through the study process and again talk about some of those specific uh, mobility recommendations that came out of the small area plan and then uh, talk about how we can go about uh, giving feedback and um, on the project. The development of the mobility study that we're working on right now uh, is really going to be guided by a group of people that are on the um, working group. Uh, the working group <clears throat> consists of staff from Ferguson Township. So that's myself, uh, David Modricker, who's the Public Works Director, Christina Bassett, who's our Community Planner, and then we also have from the Planning Commission, Jerry Binney, and then also uh, Paul Tomkill, who was part of the Small Area Plan Advisory Committee. Um, so all these people are kind of connected to this through the township itself, and then outside agencies that we have also assisting in the development of the project from the Center Region Planning Agency, we have Trish Meek, who's a transportation planner with the emphasis on planning for pedestrians and bicycles in the Center Region. 
uh, from PennDOT District 2, we have Albert Carlson, who's the PennDOT District 2 bike and ped coordinator. Um, the major routes through our study area are state roads, both, you know, Water Street, Pine Grove Road, our state facilities. So having their involvement is important as well. From CADA, we've, we've enlisted Greg Kausch, who's also a transportation planner, but really just um, focuses on transit and transit service. And then lastly, as I mentioned, McCormick Taylor being part of the working group, obviously Rob is there as a project manager for the study and then various individuals uh, who are assisting in that effort will be part of those working group meetings also. And then this group of people will meet throughout the study process. I think we have four meetings throughout the study process to really discuss um, feedback, um, what's being prepared by McCormick Taylor and then to give guidance and uh, as we move forward throughout the study process. Uh, so at this time, I was going to turn the meeting over to Jim May uh, to walk through some of the uh, stuff from the small area plan, um, but I don't see Jim being on here yet. So let's just go ahead and review his slides and I'll do my best. Uh, unfortunately, I also was not involved with the small area plan. There are some people that are on this uh, meeting that are probably more qualified to talk about what was done than I was, but these are the slides that Jim had. And what Jim really wanted to emphasize is it really was a community led planning approach. It, it really was more so facilitated by staff, but it was the community that was heavily involved and guided the project. That um, as the project was completed, there were a series of different themes or topics that came out of the small area plan. And, and one of those being a key theme was improving safety and mobility for all users, uh, right? So. The mobility study is not just about cars or just about walkers. Uh, it also considers bicyclists and transit. So, so all modes of transportation uh, are being evaluated as part of the study. And then there was a, a mobility map goals and objectives um, from the small area plan. That's kind of like the starting point, which as I mentioned also for this mobility study. And those, those goals and objectives really came from, again, the residents, the community that was engaged heavily in, in preparing that small area plan. Um, next slide there that, that um, I'm just going to again hit Jim's bullets and apologize for all of the color that um, he would have added to it that I don't have. So uh, the the mobility or the yeah, small area plan did identify uh, some specific mobility issues to be addressed and, and we'll touch on those. Um, again, emphasizing that it came from the Pine Grove community. Um, the safety, mobility, and speeding. With those issues, connectivity can be difficult. Um, and I'm not sure what all Jim wanted to emphasize with that one. So, but the last bullet residents are eager to see action in these areas. So, so that's the one thing is for this one that I noted also, and just even the attendance at this kickoff meeting, the, the um, the process for this study I can see and feel already is going to be much different than what we had for Northland area. For our Northland area mobility study, our initial uh, public meeting, uh, we, have, we have very limited attendance from a much more heavily populated and used area. So having a lot of engagement from the people in the community uh, is really going to help us as we pull together some of our mobility recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so again, then last slide here. So again, Jim emphasized that there was a a lot of mobility issues that were clearly identified as part of that plan that needed to be looked at and addressed and that they came from the community and then there's a link even there if you're on this call and you're not familiar with the small area plan there, there's a link there that you can click on to get to it and, and I'll note also that that link um, is also available on the township's website for this project uh, and Rob will touch base on that a little bit later in the presentation uh, we'll show you that that web page that's been developed is going to be a clearinghouse for access to the small area plan that was done as well as information that's generated for this meeting which will be posted later and as we go through the project and the whole process we will continue to refresh that page and update it with additional information so again my apologies for not being as colorful as what Jim May would have been in presenting the results of the small area plan, but hopefully you got the gist of it that that was really the foundation and the groundwork for what we're doing moving forward. And it was really based on the input that came from the people that are actively engaged and involved in the community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob now and Rob's going to walk through 
um, his portion of the presentation with talking through the study process and then walking us through some of those specific um, mobility issues that were identified in the small area plan. Ron, thanks for the introduction and thanks for standing in uh, in uh, at last minute on that one. Um, again, my name is Rob Watts with McCormick Taylor. Um, our office is here in State College and I've been a resident here since the um, late 1990s, um, attended Penn State and I'm actually from Juniata County. So this area is very much loved by me and, and familiar to me and my team. So we're looking forward to working with you um, sort of as neighbors in the center region here. A few words as we get started about this concept of a mobility study. I've attempted to boil it down into a little bit of an arrow chart here, but we have this premise and process and purpose. And the whole idea behind the mobility study is that you know places are built and then things change. Transportation systems change, expectations, priorities, so on and so forth. Back when Pine Grove Mills was, was built, we were riding on horses. And today we are driving cars and pretty soon the cars are going to be driving themselves. So change is an inevitability and places can change with them. And we look to handle those kinds of things in the mobility study. The process we go through is really fair, fairly standard for a planning or engineering study. We do collect data, we review, we evaluate, um, but we also imagine a little bit. We try to get creative, not keep it in the realm of engineering, but um, look at things like aspirations. What do we want the place to look like in 20 years and how do we get there? Um, but at the same time, we're looking at this process. Um, I am primarily an engineer. So I've got to think about design criteria and justification and a lot of other things that are coming down the road as projects are developed so that we can streamline the process and get a good project out there with good value to the township. In general, we're trying to improve the system. And as Ron mentioned, this is key to understand this is all users and all modes. Um, some studies focus all on the vehicles. It's all about reducing delay and increasing travel time, but that's bad because you get speed and you get a car centric environment. Others may focus on bike pads and you know kind of turn their back on the fact that the vehicles are carrying a lot of um, their weight as well and businesses and trucks and all those issues. This is an integrated study that attempts to look at them all at once. And in doing so, it's a little bit more complex, but we find that the results have been uh, very good and useful to the township in creating their capital planning. Um, it's a very practical project uh, process uh, based upon this sort of framework that we're working with here. Uh, Ron emphasized, and I will emphasize as well, the, the importance of stakeholder engagement in this process and you know, your ideas what you think of the place. And you know, we have good starting point from the small area plan because of that kind of involvement, but that type of input doesn't stop. We're gonna ask you for your input again tonight. And then later in February of uh, 2000, or 2022, we're going to have a second public meeting where we'll, we will roll out concepts. We'll show you pictures, graphics, rendering. We try to make this very accessible to you to understand the types of things that we see and that we can do with the transportation system to get it to do you know what we want it to do and fix the problems that we have out there the working group meets throughout and of course your ideas can be kind of uh slipstreamed to them to ron and i in particular um, with our emails and uh, contact information you'll have at the end and then of course the board of supervisors um, has review and approval over this plan uh, in the end but this is what we start out with with the plan we start out with you and then from there, it proceeds into data collection of all different kinds. We try to emphasize getting numbers, getting some qualitative stuff so that we can do some comparisons and justifications because the things we're going to have to answer down the road for PennDOT or for um, signal warrants or whatever are, are usually data intensive. So we begin with the end in mind and we try to get that up front. But there are a lot of other things that can't necessarily be measured, but we can uh, certainly observe them. One of the things I wanna call attention to is the next to the last bullet on this slide, the pedestrian and bike roadway safety audits. Um, a group of us did those yesterday. We walked the major streets end to end 
and we bike the major streets end to end to see the network up close. And from those experiences come things that are not necessarily numbers, but reflect a real knowledge of seeing the transportation system and, and knowing what we can do with it. And then from there, we talk about what I call transportation aspirations. You know, what do we have as a vision for Pine Grove Mills going into the future? We kind of know where it's been. We know maybe where the issues are, but what are the issues going forward? You know, self-driving cars, are, they're coming. There's more of an interest in active transportation now than maybe there was 20 or 30 years ago when, when I was a student here in the area. Um, vision Zero, which is the, the vision to reduce crashes and aim at zero fatalities and serious injuries on our transportation network. Um, that's getting much more emphasis. So we have all these ideas of, of where we want it to go. and We want to try to get on the same page and sort of align ourselves. And we also want to hear you. We want to make sure we're hearing you well as you have input to this process. In the final stages of the project, we'll take the ideas and we will create illustrations and concepts of what can be changed. We might have alternatives for certain things. Uh, the illustration shown on the right there actually came out of the Northland Area Mobility Study. It's a picture of how we could improve lighting, signage, beacons for an enhanced pedestrian crossing. Cross that, that would be Martin, Martin Street right there. So we'll take those kinds of ideas along with many others. There's a lot of things we can pull from here. Traditional things, innovative new things. We try to bring the best state of the practice to the project. And um, if you've seen some things that you think work well, you know, we, me and my family go to uh, Rehoboth Beach each year for a beach vacation, and they're doing amazing things down there for bicycles with bike lanes and, you know, carving out space. Maybe you've seen some things. Maybe you have some input on that. In the end, we'll put uh, cost estimates to these projects, and that serves as the groundwork for the township staff to be able to put this into their capital planning program. And hey, with with some you know some good planning and um, some hard work, we can get some of these projects going um, within that capital planning framework. Maybe in the next five years or so. And um, you know we will look at other things like zoning and, and ordinances and policy changes. So this is not limited to just physical changes. It certainly has um, some other pieces to it as well. We talked about the small area plan. Ron talked about the small area plan in, in detail there and several specific transportation focused recommendations came out of that process. And I want to use a map to illustrate where those different recommendations are. And I want to build that map one by one so that we kind of reflect back to you um, what we heard coming out of the small area plan. We believe in that plan. We believe it laid a great, uh, great gr uh, groundwork. It might not be the only, these might not be the only things we look at, but they certainly will be up front and center because they have been talked about the most. So let's build this map of what came out of the small area plan. And this is going to build what's called our mobility map. And we'll use this as a basis. And I want to call your attention, first of all, to the red dotted lines. These are places where uh, the small area plan identified desired connections. I think their goal was to create an interconnected bike network that you can use as a circulator, as a loop for recreation, and perhaps even to get across Pine Grove Mills back and forth. Some of these places are aspirational. They, they may not exist today or it may take some work uh, to work with landowners to get through some of those areas. Some of them may not be feasible, but as a starting point, this is where we are starting. We know that bike traffic and bike circulation is a priority in your community, and this is one of the first things we will we'll look at. Pedestrians will also be a part of this. I mentioned the, the pedestrian roadway safety audits. We spent three hours just walking the area, looking at sidewalk, looking at ramps, looking at intersections that are very hard to get across. The blinking light intersection is a really, really tough one. So the next thing we heard, next thing we saw, intersections where pedestrians may struggle or may not feel safe getting across. And I will note this includes, this includes the intersection 
at, at the blinking light. Nixon Road, Water Street, and Pine Grove Road. We're going to look at that intersection for these kinds of treatments as well. These types of treatments will be like that Martin Street um, example we showed you where lighting might play a role, signing, signalization, high visibility pavement markings. There's a whole toolbox of things that we can draw from and fit in uh, to those locations. We may evaluate them. Some may stay, and some may drop off, but these are the locations we're going to look at. Of course, the next big one is the traffic signal. Looking at the potential of getting a traffic signal installed at the blinking light intersection. And I'm going to pause here for just a second. We've collected this data already and are under contract with Ferguson Township to do this warrant study. And I can tell you the numbers are just not there yet to warrant a traffic signal. Uh, the traffic signal warrants are pretty cut and dry. They're very numeric and um, not a lot of flexibility in what we can do to massage it, so to speak. Um, but it's largely driven by the traffic volume and the conflict that's there. Uh, there are warrants for pedestrian volume for crashes. Thank goodness we don't meet a signal or need a signal because of crash experience. Um, even though you had a rather horrific one there um, over the last week or so, um, <clears throat> this is probably not something we're going to get done, but that's not going to hold us back at all. They like said we're going to look at enhanced pedestrian accommodations here. We're going to look at what's there see what we have to work with and get some other ideas in play. Even if the traffic signal doesn't uh, come through for us. Again, this is a preliminary look at this point, but I wanted to relate that to you as one of our early findings. One of the other big recommendations was a, a good look at parking, its usage, its supply, its signage. Um, how do we identify where we can park and where we can't park? Um, as we walked the study area yesterday, we discovered signage that was maybe turned the wrong way or didn't exist at all. Um, so tightening that up, figuring out what that can look like and how it can be, be improved is going to be um, a part of our study. We hear loud and clear and we see. We see it out there, the speeds on Pine Grove Road entering the study area from both directions are very high. <clears throat> Where the yellow triangles are, the, the speed limits are, um, I believe, 45 miles per hour. I'm not sure if it goes all the way to 55 on the southern end, but the 85th percentile speeds, which is what traffic engineers and the police use to evaluate the effectiveness of speed limits, um, are 55 east of Pine Grove Mills. So in other words, towards State College, signed at 45, 55 is the 85th percentile speed and on the other end beyond Ross Street, the 85th percentile speed was measured at 60 miles per hour. Words 15% of the vehicles out there are going greater than 60 miles per hour and the rest of the 85% are under, but that's the mark and the standard for looking at speed limits. Obviously speed is a concern. And speed is something we're going to address, not just at these points, but it needs to be a concerted strategy throughout what we're doing here. We're already talking about what can we do in the 25 signed areas you know, to say, hey, this is, this is a low speed environment. Get the expectation to be that that's how we travel through this area. And finally, in building the last piece of this, the small area plan really emphasized that access into and, and being a neighbor to the Rothrock State Forest was a true asset of your community. And being able to have places where you, your community can get into uh, those trails, access those trails um, is, is a priority. So we've laid out these two locations, one that we like to call more of a local, that's the in town, more of a local access connection. Perhaps parking isn't needed. Perhaps a bike rack would encourage uh, people to ride bikes there or use this uh, bike network that we're talking about to get there. The other location along Route 26, Kepler Road parking lot, um, it seems is emerging as the way or the place to direct the general public to park if they're in a vehicle um, so that we have space for that. This is definitely evolving. 
and we would like your your input and comment um, on this one. And I think uh, there are lots of folks that do have some opinions on that one. So this is our mobility map. This is where we're starting, and these are the issues we're definitely going to cover. Uh, do you have other concerns, other issues, or other ideas for what can be done out here? And if so, then you're at the right meeting, and you are hopefully going to participate using a number of these different um, opportunities that we're going to roll out through the website. You can see the link. You see the link up here to the. This is the township website. We're just using a tiny URL designation to get you there. Tinyurl.com slash PGM mobility will get you there. You can also find it on the township website. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and put on the website, and we will annotate it with links to the, the mapping and the review uh, of different materials, be it the small area plan. Um, I believe we're going to put um, various maps and the, and the uh, project schedule up there. Um, you can also link to them directly off the website. You don't need to watch the presentation to get to them. Most importantly, we have a survey link there. This is one of the online type of surveys that you can go on, complete it online. You can type things in, type in your ideas. Um, the survey itself is mostly a checkbox activity, and we think we can you can get through it pretty quickly. It's not an extended thing to do. We hope you will use that survey form to put in your input on what you've seen tonight and uh, what you see every day as you travel around Pine Grove Mills. This is what the page will look like when you get there. Um, this is actually taken last night. We now have links to some of our mapping down here. If you found us through the website, you clicked up here to get our link and the survey will be opened and should be opened either now or immediately after we're done here. So what are our next steps and what does the schedule look like for the project? Here's our schedule sort of in graphic um, graphic format. Uh, we've we're already largely through our data collection effort. Um, and we are here at our public meeting, this first star in the middle of October. The next thing we'll do is start to assess some of the data and use some of the aspirations and the feedback that we're going to get from this survey and from our working group to then start concept development. And then we will roll those out to the working group first and then to the public in early February, early to mid February. We have a little bit of a, a, an area there we can shoot for. You'll have an opportunity to see it, have input there, give us your comments, see these things. Hopefully we'll be in person. I, I think that works, it works out best. It worked well for the other mobility study. Following that, we'll have a, a report and some documentation and a very graphic um, graphics heavy report that can illustrate this. We'll develop concept um, cost estimates and deliver a prioritized list of projects um, in that report for the supervisor's consideration. And then we'll finalize things hopefully by the end of April. By that point, we'll be all looking forward to summer again. So Ron, I don't know if you want to join me back here on the video again. Our contact information, uh, our email addresses are right here on the slide, and I believe we can post those also on the website so that you can click and find them and you don't have to memorize them. Sure, that's a good idea. Yep. So they'll be up there. Um, but as, as the project managers on the township side and the consultant side, um, we have access to the team, we have access to the working group, and... Um, that might be one of the quickest ways to get to us uh, once the survey closes, but the survey is definitely the way to go right now, and I really hope you will take care of that. Thank you again for listening as well as you have. Uh, we would like to take an opportunity to listen and um, take some questions if you have them or just some comments in general. Um, you know, your time is valuable as well, so we won't prolong it, but we will give you the rest of the time. Uh, I too want to thank everybody for for jumping on this evening and um, listening to Rob and I drone on for a little while. Um, but yeah, this is a good study, and uh, we're kind of excited to see what you all have to say. We know most of you had a lot of input in the small area plan to get us to the foundation to where we are, how we're starting building from. 
but uh, you know you may have new ideas or fresh ideas. Uh, maybe you changed your mind about something even. So we want to have that feedback. So you could again either type something into the chat box uh, and we'll read it if you're not comfortable unmuting yourself. If you do want to, you know, speak, talk, have a dialogue, you know, just raise your hand or unmute yourself there and we'll do that. I also want to mention too, um, you know, we're, where everything here we're doing is is online. Uh, and that, that for some of this stuff is a great way to do it, but we do recognize that um, not everybody has access to the internet or is comfortable on the computer. Uh, so if you know of somebody who didn't make it or didn't don't want doesn't want to go online, we do have printed materials of of some of the maps that are available on the website as well as the comment form in printed form. They're available here at the township building at the reception area. You can come in and request those. Uh, take them with you and, and uh, fill out the comments and, and send them back or put them in the mail either way. Um, so that opportunity is available as well. If you know of somebody that you think uh, might not be comfortable in the digital world, uh, we're sensitive to that. So. This is your chance, folks. I see a hand raised. Carrie, can you? That's probably my hand. Can you see there it is. Um, one, just one uh, comment on the mobility study. Can we add Sunday Drive into the mobility study only for one reason? Because of the cut, fill, cut, the cut through traffic that can't make the the, the stops the the um, at the blinking light. You know, you can't take the um, left turn. So we get a lot of cut through traffic here, and they speed through Sunday Drive down to Rosemont, and then they um you know head out down 26 there by on uh, the naked egg so that needs to be looked at how we're going to resolve that one i'm hoping that with the intersection being redone maybe we can get people to turn i don't know it's that's such a blind spot there on that intersection with the with pine grove hall there so that is anyway. a difficult intersection yep um the, the sunday drive is within the study area we didn't yeah. specifically talk about it but but thanks for your comments on that that's something we'll definitely Mm -hmm. uh, take a look at and consider um, as we work yeah. through the mobility study. Yep. Yeah. And one more, one more comment. Um, being an avid mountain biker, I use the trails all the time through Chestnut Street. There's an there's another access that comes up. Uh, is it Deer? I forget what the name of it. Deerwood or uh, there's another access in there too, which I think is a little bit better of an access for the mountain bikers than Chestnut Street because. The problem with Chestnut Street access is you have to climb 26 and the traffic is horrendously coming down that mountain crazy all the time, you know, so it's a little dangerous sometimes trying to get up 26 to get to Chestnut Street and access to trails there, even for walkers. I know a lot of the walkers come up. Um, they kind of cut through the houses to get over to the, the trails to do their hiking up on the trails there, too, so. But. Um, as a mountain biker, also representing the mountain bike clubs, we all are using the Kepler Road parking lot as our area to start our mountain bike rides up there, not using, um, coming, not coming through Pine Grove Mills. Okay, mm -hmm. just, just to mm -hmm. let you know, that's more of the, that's more of the uh, preferred access for the mountain bikers. Okay, good, good to know. So that's consistent with what at least came out of the small area plan, then. Yeah, yeah. And I also believe that on DCNR is across the street from Dep Kepler Road, they're going to build a trail down to the uh, power lines. Uh, that was uh, on the uh, on the um, uh, list of things to do. They're going to cut a trail down there because now the power lines, now that they're stoned, they connect Muster Gap. But I know we have a issue with the property owner in there that, you know, whether you can actually go through that power line area or not. But Muster Gap and Kepler parking lot are connected now through that access road so kind of neat you know makes things fun okay that's enough for me okay thank you <clears throat> anyone else there's my hand raised laura I see you. <clears throat> Hi. There you are. Hi, Go ahead. Thanks. thanks. Um, well, I, I guess I'll just uh, I'll confirm what the person was saying uh, before me that 
at, uh, I believe it's Deepwood Drive access um, for hikers uh, is really a good access point because actually you have closer access to, to parking, um, to on-street parking <clears throat> down in the village. Um, and it's a much nicer walk up Deepwood than up um, Water Street. Um, and even if we improve the sidewalk so that it reaches Chestnut, um, it's still probably a longer um, a longer walk. And there's not going to really be parking at Chestnut, even though DCNR was interested. The folks that live there really are not interested. Um, and so far, the village has been supporting that non-interest of having that parking there. Um, and I just wanted to also <clears throat> mention, uh, I'm familiar with your work to the consultants, and it's um, with the Northland, uh, Northland Area Plan, and that was so well done. Um, and I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to refer, though, to the photo um, that you used with the gooseneck lights. Um, I wanted to request um, that we make sure that we incorporate the culture uh, the style um, that you really saw begin to take shape in the small area plan um, when you're doing your renderings, because what I think the village is really hoping is that we kind of shy away from those gooseneck, more urban, uh, high traffic looking street streetscapes and try to really emphasize the human scale, human level, human height, eye-catching, um, uh, styled uh, street fixtures to really try to help us uh, create the, the consciousness in those that are driving through that what they're driving through is a village, uh, not just a street corner. So just emphasizing the style um, the old timey, we called it style as we were doing the small area plan um, and making sure that we're thinking about that street level look, um, really uh, recreating that that village look that we want that we want to have. Um, and then lastly, just it really part of our problem with uh, the village, as I'm sure you know, is um, alleyways ownership condition uh and actually how integrated and how important they actually are even though we have a lot of major issues with them and they do connect sometimes um uh, really important things like the school so i hope that we can come out of this with a really targeted and very specific plan of how to resolve some very specific issues that are real barriers to achieving, say, for example, that red dotted line, um, that, that part of that is on private property. So to achieve that goal, it'll be, it'll be really important that we have specifics and that they're laid out in a way that we can um, begin working to achieve them. And thank you so much for your time, and thank you for allowing me um, these comments. Thank you. Glad you were here, mm. especially, especially the comments you provided. Thanks, Laura. Good stuff. Let's see another hand raised. Matt, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and camera on, and away you go. Yeah. There you are. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> By the way, project manager also with the university. So I think our limit for any meeting is three project managers anymore. And we're at capacity. <laughs> we'll see if we keep this easy. I just want to say, first off, excellent presentation. Really gave a great perspective on all the hard work that's been put into it and the data that's been collected. And I appreciate also the fact that you did a qualitative analysis, really walking around. I saw the green vest yesterday, you know, working from home. It's one of those advantages where you kind of open the blinds. I'm kidding. It's not that kind of town, right? And you watch folks go by, you're like, hey, what's going on? So it was good to see that. And I just want to kind of emphasize first what um, Weather had mentioned. And sorry, Weather, I don't know your name. And 
but really I know I walk that area by Lois Lane and Sunday Drive in the morning and there are cars that come speeding through Sunday Drive trying to I would I believe cut that corner because they cannot make the left at South Nixon and Pine Grove Road so that is something you know that we want to go ahead and see what we can do on you know improve the safety there the other thing as well is I'm curious to learn more about some of the you know maybe low hanging fruit like the beacons and other opportunities we have to make that intersection of Water Street and South Nixon safer. Because as it is right now, it's impossible to cross Pine Grove Road from Water Street, we'll say from the gas station side or from the opposite corner. That just, there is no pedestrian crossing there. And I know myself in the mornings when I try and cross South Nixon. So there's really no way for me to communicate that I'm even close to the intersection. It might be dark out, cars are coming down the mountain. You hope that when they have the right turn signal on, they're going to make a right down Pine Grove Road and not make a quick left in front of you onto South Nixon. So anything we can do either through beacons, again, appropriate for the, the streetscape that we're going for and that small town feel, I think would be advantageous for us, especially if that is, you know, sounds like probably more low, it's a little bit lower in the, uh, or a little bit more possible, I should say, than a street warrant or I shouldn't say the blinking light uh, changing to a regular street light. So a couple things that I just wanted to put out there in, in that area. But um, other than that, I just want to say excellent presentation and look forward to the next steps and where we have other opportunities to weigh in on kind of the feedback from others here as well in the survey, which of course, you know, I encourage everybody to go ahead and get out there to your friends and your neighbors to help them contribute. So thank you for the time. Excellent comments, thank Matt, you. thank you. Weather has a hand up again. Yep. Uh, just hi, Matt. I see you every morning walking past my house. It's Henry. <laughs> I want to ask you guys one more question about the uh, the light um, that you can't put the light in because the traffic study says no. What is the criteria that we can't put a light in? I'm just kind of curious about why we can't put a light in there. Sure, you know? that's a good question. Rob, maybe you want to touch a little bit on the warrants that are looked at. Well, sure, Ron, you could do it just as good of a job, but uh, there's a document uh, that is the guideline nationally for traffic signals and traffic signal warrants. There's a series of signal warrants, uh, anything from traffic volume to crash history. Um, there are some network and um, you know railroad crossing warrants. Um, suffice it to say they, they've thought through the many situations um, that you could have a traffic signal in. And the ones we look at and that are the easiest to evaluate and, and what we're basing our assessment on at this point is the traffic, are the traffic volume and pedestrian and crash warrants, uh, which are the ones that are probably the most used. Um, the volumes on the side street of Water Street are really what control this whole thing. And um, without getting too far into the weeds, when a vehicle pulls up there on, on Water Street and turns right, for instance, that's a huge volume. That's the main turning movement at that intersection off of Water Street. Um, by the requirements of the warrants, while that's a huge volume, many of those vehicles have a little opposition. There's a little conflict with the traffic that's coming along Pine Grove Road from the west. And so those vehicles can pull out of there very easily um, for the most part. And by the rules that are written into these guidelines, we must exclude those vehicles that um, pull up and then basically pull off within about five seconds. Um, they, they have minimal conflict. And when you do that, you have a volume, the remaining volume is just not sufficient to trigger the signal warrants. Um, so that's that's kind of where it is. PennDOT, the PennDOT district here has a very strong rule on how we evaluate that. We actually watched the vehicles and counted them, the ones with minimal conflict and the ones that entered with conflict to get the numbers that we're using. And uh, that's, that's where it's landing right now. The other thing in play here is that um, COVID has affected uh, traffic volumes. So, so many of us working from home and doing things from home and we compared our traffic count that we took with ones from before the pandemic and we're still 
over the course of a day about 12% lower. And during the peak hours, we're anywhere from 20 to 25% lower, comparing 2021 to 2018. So, so that you have those two things in play. We have to we have to exclude certain vehicles that can only include others, and volumes have actually shrunk a bit at the intersection, you know, since before the pandemic. But I think I think the overall issue is the blind curve. That's the issue. We just had an accident up there because the person didn't negotiate the curve and went into the creek. And to cross the road, you got to be able to look around Pine Grove Hall to see if a car is coming around that turn at high speeds. You know, and that's that's really the issue. So I think while your study makes sense and everything makes sense, it's that blind spot that needs to be figured out somehow. I don't know what the answer is, but that's. I mean, I typically go to the post office and cross there so I can see around the blind, the blind spot to get across the street, you know. Yeah. So. We, we even noticed that when we were doing our pedestrian audit that, that someone not didn't cross right at Nixon Road. They actually went down mm -hmm. and crossed right on the curve so they could see both ways uh, before they cross. Actually, like a, a mid-block crossing as opposed to crossing right at the intersection. I mean, would a, would a, <clears throat> would a crosswalk work to slow down traffic? I mean, is that an answer like so, at, at the post office since you have everybody has a lot of people have to go to the post office to get their mail. So they have to cross the street from Nixon Road. And I mean, would a crosswalk work with a blinking light or something like this? Just throwing it out there as an idea. Yeah. So there's some of the things that we've already talked about when we were doing our, our, mm -hmm. uh, our walk around on the pedestrian audit. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're going to look at those kind of things. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. it is recognized that there is no delivery within Pine Grove Mills. You go to the post office to pick up your mail, whether you stop and park in your car on your way home mm -hmm. or whether you you walk there to enjoy yeah. <clears throat> the outdoors and pick up your mail, which is probably what I would do if I had a choice. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. we recognize that there's a demand for that and we're just we're trying to figure out what's the best way to get people to and from. So we're going to be looking at all those different things. Yeah. I, I did want to reiterate what you know what Rob was talking about. So the traffic signal is not something we can just put in if we wanted to. It is it is regulated by uh, the state and there is national guidance that they even fall back on. So we, we really have to play by those rules. And if we don't, if we don't meet one of those criterion, then we, we don't have the option to put the signal in, even if we wanted to. And and there's, you know, the, the board of supervisors was committed to it and there's even a desire to budget the money to to construct it if the warrants are met. And I'll say uh -huh. this too. Um, sorry, uh, even though the warrants aren't met now, <clears throat> I think that's something that'll definitely be on the list of aspirations from this study moving forward. Um, as things change, who knows what will happen in the vicinity? Mm -hmm. You know, some other type of control at that intersection uh, is something that'll probably end up being on the mobility aspirations list, even if it's not something that's what we've already talked about as low hanging fruit stuff that we can implement right away out of the box. So, yeah, I, I think personally, if you put a light in, you're going to increase the traffic accidents because people are going to be speeding up and hit the blind curve and someone's going to be stopped there at the light and they're going to go right in the back of them, you know, and that's. It would be a, it would be a very interesting one to design that that yeah. very issue that you brought up would probably mean there'd be some type of a near side signal mm -hmm. in advance of the intersection so people would know if it's changing before. The, so there's, yeah. there's lots of different design strategies right. you can do to try to mitigate those types of issues, but um, unfortunately installing a signal is not a just is not a or sorry, the yeah. limited sight distance at the intersection is not a warrant we can use to put a signal in. So we're going to look at other stuff. Um, somebody even threw out, hey, can we make it a four-way stop? <laughs> Never thought of that. Yeah. But nobody's going to like that when it's going through town. No. But <clears throat> there's different warrants for stop signs yeah. than there are for traffic signals. So that's something we're going to look at. Yeah. Not saying, you know, who knows. But yeah, anything like that that you folks have ideas, questions, suggestions, yeah, throw them out there for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sherry, I see you have your hand raised there. So if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your camera, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Hi, thank you. Um, this is probably directed more toward Rob, I'm going to guess. Can you hear me yet? Yeah, you're good. Go okay, ahead. Good. Um, I live on St. Elmo's Lane. I live on the end uh, where you were walking by yesterday, right where the accident was in front of our garage. Um, but um, Two things I wanted to mention. One is when you said um, it looks like people get to the light can pretty easily and then make that right coming down the mountain. I'm not sure all the drivers agree with that because 
I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are drivers who come down the mountain to avoid the light, turn on to Butternut, then left, come down St. Elmo's Lane, which the township wow. refers to as an alley, um, at a pretty good rate of speed in the mornings just to avoid having to stop there. Um, I don't know what can be done about that, probably nothing, because if it's a four-way stop and they don't feel like stopping, they're still going to to take that right and come down St. Elmo's Lane and try to cut off that traffic that stopped there. But that is just something I wanted to mention that that does happen. Um, and also, is there any way, I, I know what you're saying about everything that's in place with the stoplight as far as rules and what you can have and what you can't have, a, when you can't have a stoplight. What about, I know from having to drive very late at night, um, that some of the lights in State College revert to just a blinking light after a certain time at night. Um, they go from being a regular stoplight, red, green, you know, yellow to just blinking, yellow both ways or red one way and yellow the other way. Is there any way a stoplight could be installed and be on a timer that those early morning rush hours and then the late afternoon rush hours would be where it would operate as a regular stoplight, but the other times be a blinking light, or is that not possible? Just curious. Ron, you want to tackle that one, or I, I, I can, yeah, yeah, and then you can you can correct me if I'm wrong anywhere, Rob. <laughs> so, um, so I mean, it's, it's a it's an interesting idea, Sh Sherry. Um, but again, in order to put the signal in, we have to meet one of those warrants, whatever they are. And even the peak hour, which is when when it feels like there's most of the delay and the congestion, we don't meet the warrant for the peak hour even. Uh, so it's highly unlikely that PennDOT would would agree to give us a permit in that in that type of regard or format. Th there's also been studies out there and um, municipalities are starting to change over how they operate the signals, um, finding that we're seeing more crashes occurring at night when the signals are in flash as opposed to when they're cycling. So many mm. municipalities like Ferguson Township, we're no longer cycling our signals in flash at night. We we let them run 24 seven. They're all fully actuated. Uh, so the people on the main line will have a green unless there's somebody on the side street. So uh, that flashing operation where there is a desire for the signal, we're trying to avoid that at night to improve safety. Yeah, and, and something to add to that, I know another reason I've heard of why they take away some of the flashing is so that pedestrians at night can use and actuate the signal and then cross with the benefit of the signal at all hours of the day. Right. Yep. Um, and one concern I would have with just operating a signal in very limited hours would be for those pedestrians that do come along and, and are depending on that signal to give right of way and stop the vehicles, because that is one of the real advantages of putting a signal there is that we could we could use the signals to regulate the traffic flow and give pedestrians um, a much better opportunity for getting across the street, even even add things like leading pedestrian intervals or you know, we can look at exclusive pedestrian phases. But uh, but yeah, I think that's why we don't operate signals oftentimes um, in limited hours. OK, thank you. Thanks for sharing your comments, Sherry. Appreciate it. Um, I see Vic Sparrow, yeah. you have your hand raised. Yeah, can you hear me guys? Yes, yes. Yeah, right ahead. so thank, thank you. you again so much for doing this. I had to join a little bit late. Sorry about that. So I'm sorry if you already discussed this. So I think safety is very important. If I had to rank priorities, you know, safety is probably number one. I'd probably put pedestrian safety at the flashing light as number one because I'm one of those people walking from West Pine Grove Mills to the post office and back. Um, you also wonder, uh, sometimes I wish the Ferguson Township Police were there a little more often to mm. actually enforce the um, speed limit on Pine Grove Road, which is already there. I think that would make things safer. But let me ask you a question, I, and I'm not a transportation person, so I, I don't know what's possible and what's not. I have been down some roads before where people felt the only way to slow traffic down was to either have a, you know, a cop car with a flashing lights all the time, or they actually made the road so that you could not go straight on the road. You actually had to drive to the left and drive to the right, and maybe their flower beds or something like that. 
but you forcibly slowed people down Mm -hmm. because they can't drive straight through. And I don't know on a road like this whether that sort of thing is possible. Is there a way to actually make people slow down, to have to drive to the left, drive to the right, drive to the left, drive to the right, to, and it forcibly slows them down? Is that even a possibility? I'll say yes, it is. Um, so what you're talking about are, is what's called, we refer to as traffic calming. Okay. Um, and there's a process even to implement traffic calming measures, even on state highways, which uh, Pine Grove Road is. Um, so anything like that would have to go through and get approval by the Department of Transportation as well. Um, but I totally agree with your comments about safety being the highest priority. Anytime we're doing studies, we look at safety and mobility. You know, um, safety's first. You know, make sure everything is safe. Yeah. Uh, then we look at the efficiency side of it, like how easy is it for people to get around, but safety is always the number one priority. Uh, so I appreciate your comments about traffic calming because it, okay. you know, enforcement is effective while it's being done. Um, the right. other thing, it, you know, the, the, then traffic calming is another major, and it, it could be, you know, it's basically working with the geometry of the road. You mentioned about shifting people left to right. <clears throat> that can be effective. Vertical displacements can also be effective. Speed humps, those types of things are right. very effective with right. slowing cars down. Uh, yeah, there are just, issues with those for maintenance as well. But, you know, there's lots of different ideas, even, um, you know, gateway treatments, things of that nature to try and, um, you know, identify it as a neighborhood. Those types of things to try to help slow vehicles down as they get into into the um, Pine Grove Mills area. So uh, that's a good comment to, me, to make. It yep. makes sense to me because. If you can't put a light there, you can't fix the light. Maybe you can fix the roads. <laughs> okay, so I'll just thank you again yeah. for the thought. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, some, one of the things that we've noted is a as a limitation with the curvature in the road there, uh, with Pine Hall right there by across the post office. That same curvature actually does slow cars down. Believe it or not, uh, they probably still go through there faster than they should. <clears throat> but if that was opened up and people see farther they'll tend to go faster. So uh, good comment. I uh, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, that's something we'll take note of. And, you know, that may be something coming out of this study as well as, look, we need to maybe consider doing a traffic calming study in this area. Mel, I see you got your hand raised, friend. You're up, dude. Yeah, um, I'm on, I guess. Well, you were there. Anyway. You can hear me, but you can't see me. I don't care. Um, <laughs> here's the deal. You can share your camera, too. Or, or well, you said, I, I tried. Um, there you are. You're talking about warrants about traffic signals. There are also sets of warrants about crosswalks. I found that out because a few years back, I recommended a whole series of crosswalks to be in place in Pine Grove Mills. I was assured by staff that this would be pursued, but that it had to wait until the painting season. The crew would be out painting things. Well, it never happened. I guess the painting crew got lost in the woods or something. Anyway, for example, I was told when I made that recommendation that there cannot be a crosswalk at the very sensible point of the bend in the road by the the Pine Grove Hall because of some regulations. The walls don't allow it. So it seems to me like we're sort of in a box here that we can't find our way out of. We have all these great ideas, but as soon as we try to implement one, we run into another set of warrants that prohibits things. I'd like to point out that the warrants do not allow for crosswalks the width of what we would require in Pine Grove Mills because our sidewalks are too narrow and the warrants require wider crosswalks than we have sidewalks to place them on. And there is really only one crosswalk in the whole village and that is in front of the school. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Mel. We we are gonna be looking at crosswalks as part of the mobility study. so I'm, I'm not sure about some of the regulations that you cited there, but Rob's going to look into all those things for us as we work through it to make sure we're doing everything appropriately. And one thing we talked about during the, the safety audit was um, coming up with, you know, even a standard way or, and reason for putting the crosswalks in certain places. Um, and one of the reasons you do a crosswalk is to direct pedestrians to the safest place to cross a particular road Um, and especially if we're going to enhance certain crossings you know one of the strategies I think you will see us pursuing 
is directing people to the safest place to cross um, and, and giving them that that opportunity in a safe place. Um, you know, people make decisions to cross where they will, um, but we are understanding better as a result of those studies where this desire is. And uh, I think we can we can start down that list <laughs> and start looking at that list if you still have it. All right. Any anyone else that wants to share live this evening? I don't. I want to remind you all that the survey is out there. We really want to encourage everybody, even if you've made comments tonight, to to go ahead and and uh, complete the online survey. It'll be available on the website tomorrow. Uh, it's a it's a form you can fill out uh, and submit. That'll go directly to our consultant, who's going to be summarizing all those comments. Uh, and again, if you know of someone that would probably prefer to do something. Uh, the good old fashioned way by writing it out on paper. We have those printed out here available at the township building too. Uh, I just want to mention one more thing about crosswalks. The crosswalk on Nixon Road is actually a blind crosswalk and needs help. And I bet uh, Matt could probably, you know, comment on that too. But it is a blind, it is a blind crosswalk with people racing on Nixon Road up the hill there. And it's, it's kind of dangerous sometimes, you know. You gotta, that's the, that's you right where the uh, the crest of the hill there, just south yeah. of Sunday Drive. You know, okay, yep, I know where you, you mean. Know, Ten years ago, we took that crest down. We we took care of that and then put the crosswalk in, but it's still a blind crosswalk. People are racing through, you know, they race through Nixon Road there past the cemetery. We, we had one crash there when, you know, someone lost control, went on Ted's property and crashed into the light pole and took the electricity out. Ted wasn't happy. You know, because someone's car was in his middle of his goat yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the locations yeah. that came out of the small area plan yeah. for for improvements. Yep, that's definitely one location we'll be looking at. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Matt. I see you got your hand up again. Yes, and I won't even need to turn the video on. I just wanted to make sure that we see the comment from Vicky um, pertaining to the intersection by the naked egg and the the speed limit sign there. That was all. Thank mm. you. Yeah, that's the only one in the chat room. You want to read that for us there, Carrie? Oh, just so okay. everybody has benefit. Vicky says, just past the naked egg, the speed limit changes to 45. That 45 mile per hour sign was there before the developments in Thistlewood. And the one on the hill on the north side was there. Uh, now there's more traffic pulling out onto Route 26. Any chance of removing that sign or replacing it with a slower speed? That's one of the things we uh, we kind of noticed when we were doing our pedestrian audit when we got down to the end of Meckley Road down by Hillside Drive. Um, the, the speed of the cars going by there and the ability visibility because that was another location of concern with crossing. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, Rob's going to be looking at specifically at that there, but we can look at it with respect to the whole study area too. I think that was something that even came out of the small area plan, the speed of vehicles through the through the small area. Anybody else? And again, don't feel like this is the end. If uh, you have thoughts later, again, you got Rob's email, my email. If you see us out walking around the neighborhood again with our vest on, feel free to stop and talk. That's the good stuff. Um, and, and please, please do take time to take a look at the graphics that are on the website. Um, fill out the comment form. Um, that kind of feedback is very, very important to what McCormick Taylor is going to be doing to help pull together some ideas um, for this project. I see Mel has his hand up again. Oh, OK. Mel, if you'd like to add I did, but I there. took it down because the point really is irrelevant. I'll, I'll I'll take the survey. Thank you. OK, thanks, Mel. OK, well, not seeing anyone else's hand raised or. 
anything else in the chat, I'll, I'll thank you all again for attending. Um, and I encourage you once again to please fill out the survey and send them in. We got a two week comment period that we're uh, hoping to get those back in so we can continue moving forward with the overall study process.